Matt Whitman, great to have you on Pines with Aquinas. Nice to be here, man. This nice. is the great. music is catchy too. That adds to the effect. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting really pumped up over here. Um, I said it off air. I think this might be my most anticipated interview, which is honestly, no offense, kind of disappointing because I've had some pretty big like theologians and philosophers <laughs> on. They're like, yeah, 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 whatever. Get Whitman. I understand. I, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. I'm feeling really guilty that I didn't drop my water bottle in like a paper bag or something so that I could at least uh, play along. It's 10 in the morning. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't worry. I'm drinking water as well. Um, and I want to let everybody know right now that if we get 1,000 thumbs up in the next 24 hours, I will send this glorious beer stein to Matt Whitman. <laughs> so hit that thumbs up and, and feel free to share this on Facebook or wherever you're listening. But Matt, it's really, really great to connect with you. Um, I've dabbled in some of your videos and you are just terribly charming and you seem, I know it might be easy to fake, but you seem like very humble and very open and um, yeah, very honest in, in your sort of interactions with people of different faiths. And uh, I hope I do that. I want to do that more. And so it was, it's really cool that we get to connect. Yeah, well, it is easy to fake because you have the power of editing. So all you do is you just go through it and edit out everything that's prideful and obnoxious. And then people are like, oh, he seems like a nice guy. It's a great trick. I wish I had an editor for real life. So I saw a bit of that interview you did with that Catholic theologian while you were sitting down eating fries. And I want to know how many comments referenced ASMR. That's what I need to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, the comment section there was 5% people angry about Catholicism and Protestantism. Nice. And then about 5% people concerned with us not eating the fries at a rapid enough pace. And then about 90% what you just described. I do the, the first video, I started editing it. And every time we take a bite of anything, it was just a horrible sounding. It sounded like an earthquake was happening. So I'm like, oh, I got to delete everything where we're taking a bite. And then people started getting upset that we weren't eating enough. Like, yeah, I, you need to eat. You need to get some muscle on those bones. You're both too skinny. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't win. Oh, man. So for those who are watching right now, maybe they're not that familiar with you. To tell us about your channel, how you started it, what the ride's been like. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a historical theology guy. I did the pastor thing for a long time. And I was in a church in Western Wyoming out by Jackson, if people know where that is, like beautiful, rugged Yellowstone, Teton Mountain territory. And it's one of the most remote places in the continental United States. And so the whole congregation is just always traveling. If you go to Home Depot, that's a weekend. And so two Sundays a month was really good in terms of reliable attendance for somebody at our church. So like, well, I'm just going to use this, this fad that is the internet to mm -hmm. make little short 10 minute, more like daily show versions of the, the sermons that we were doing every week where we would go straight through a book of the Bible real slow. So to keep up and behind and I could keep doing things on Sunday the way I wanted. And then the other people started watching and then mm. more other people started watching. And then eventually I got done doing the book of Acts and I was like, well, what do you do next? And then it was just like, oh, and the world is wide open. I can cover anything I want to about theology or whatever. And I decided to be kind of a cool place to play out my fascination with the history of Christianity and why it evolved the way it did and why are there different expressions of the thing instead of just one monolithic block. Why is that? My thesis would be that that's actually a good thing and that the gospel and the, the message of Jesus and redemption and the whole story has been in front of more people and resonated with more people because the gospel is so adaptable to different times, different cultures, different languages. And so I, I'm fascinated by the taxonomy of the church and how it all fits together. And so I started making videos about that, but instead of me going in wikipedia a bunch of stuff and then acting like I actually knew it, so you really didn't. I started going to other people's churches and letting them explain where they came from and what they think and how they got there and what they do in church. And so that's a lot of what I do now. That's really cool. I think the first video I saw of you was a video in which you talked about being a Christian who deconverted, which is all the rage these days, and then coming back to faith, which is a fascinating thing, I think. Yeah, uh, you started with that one. All right. We don't that's have to. Interesting... We can... <laughs> 
No, no, no. I mean, that's the video you started with. You're allowed to ask the question. Oh, I mean, gotcha, gotcha. Dude, fire away. Everything's cool. Yeah. Uh, no, I, but I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, what a tricky thing. Really good. Yeah. I, I was cool with sharing most of that story, but as I look back on that video, I'm like, man, my slight guardedness on that. The thing that it mostly masked was how much the process hurt and, and was really profoundly painful to spend your whole life as a theist. And then honestly, just in a moment that that heart, mind, truth level gut check of, yeah, but like, God, you're still there, right? Like when Pooh and Eeyore would just kind of tap each other and be like, I just wanted to be sure of you. Like I did that and I was like, oh. This is the first time ever that I honestly feel like there's nothing there. And it was, it was devastating. I, I'm not sure I did a very good job of communicating how much that stung and how difficult and alone that process was. But also, how do you believe something you don't believe? It just epistemologically, how do you think a thing you don't think? How do you hold a conviction you don't hold? And so, yeah, I just went through this period where I was forced to just be gut level honest it's not like oh my feelings were hurt by church and i just needed to rethink my faith a little bit it's like no i just genuinely went through a, a good stretch where i didn't think there was a deity or any first cause to anything and i uh, what an interesting process to take the whole thing apart and then be surprised when the whole thing came back together in a new and different way so yeah that's what that video is about hmm yeah, I, I don't know if you feel like this sometimes, like running a, a YouTube channel that's relatively successful as far as subscribers and, and watches. There's this constant nagging fear in the back of my mind that I'm going to end up a Catholic hack, you know, like somebody who is just more <laughs> interested in making that, that YouTube revenue than I am actually pursuing the truth. And I, I really do think that's n not the case. You know, um, I, I don't think I am. Um, but I, you know, for example, like, what if you had this explosive YouTube channel and you had a lot to lose in kind of deconverting? You know, I, I, I really think it does take courage. Like, I don't want people to be atheists, but if you're going to abandon this thing that you've held to for so long and lose friendships and mm -hmm. whatever else, like, that's that's a courageous thing. And um, again, I'm not because I know in the com box we get a ton of people saying, "How could you possibly say an atheist could be courageous?" But I do think it does take courage. Like these people who are singing in these big prominent evangelical churches and I'm sure Catholic personalities as well to come out and actually lose something uh, because as you say, you can't believe what you can't believe anymore. That, that does take courage. Yeah. And I think the side that is hard to comprehend if you haven't been through something like that is the, the desired genuine, I mean, the only people in your lives who you really know deeply are people who you've known through church and ministry stuff at that point or the vast majority. Why would you want to put them in a difficult spot just because you're going through a thing? But also, you can't lie about Jesus. You can't lie about faith. As soon as you start lying to yourself or lying to other people about faith, you got a problem. Now, by lying, I mean coming out and boldly saying this is exactly where I'm at. This is exactly what I think. These are things I never, ever wrestle with. I don't mean acknowledging doubt or strain or difficulty or being okay with asking questions and having those questions take a very long time to sort through. I, I just mean, like what you were describing, becoming a Catholic hack, becoming a Protestant hack, becoming a person who pretends to think and feel and deeply hold things that you don't because it's your job. And now you just got to stick with it because of some mm -hmm. cost and you're in and mm -hmm. you don't have anything else you can do. So, yeah, I, I, I respect anybody who's willing to tell the truth about where they're actually at and what they're actually thinking. But yeah, you, what you, I think, you, 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 oh, go you, ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, I, I'm imagining people like, say, Joel Osteen or somebody who have, have these prominent platforms uh, or for that matter, Pope Francis, I don't know. But like, imagine them kind of stepping away from that, like the... Yeah, the, that just must be excruciating. But yeah, but I guess what's the, the alternative is you just start lying to yourself. And I guess that's why I think we should always sort of, not always, but occasionally sort of reflect and question our own motivations. Because if it's possible for other people to be hacks without realizing it, which I'm sure it is, right? People can be that deceived. 
then it's possible for me, I suppose, and I, so I ought to be at least somewhat reflective about that. Right. Well, I think there's a third way, but that third way doesn't fit very well with how we do culture right now. And that third way is to give and receive patience with each other. Hmm. The third way is if I'd been in an environment, and maybe I was, maybe I just underestimated everybody in my life, but I didn't tell anybody about this thing because I didn't want to do damage. And I felt like my options were, I have a flag. The flag is my soul. I can cram that into the ground on this side of the line, or I can cram that into the ground on this side of the line, but that flag must be crammed. And if it's not crammed, like, well, then you're, you're nothing, you're nobody. So there's only, you always have to be in a place of conclusion, of finality, and in a non-forgiveness culture, which is what we've built for each other in the last 10 or 15 years, which is one of the great regrets and disappointments of the moment in history that I share with everybody who's here right now, that, that air of unforgiveness means there is no time for ambiguity about where your flag is planted. Your flag planting provides power to one of only two binary options for how to think about the world and what philosophies and theologies you hold to. So pick one. Yes. And if you don't, we have no use or time yes. for you. And so as a result, I think everybody feels pressure to be like, oh, man, I guess I need to let everybody know right now that my process is over. I took a week and a half on it, and I am now no longer a theist, and I now think all of these other things because ooh, no man's land is a very lonely place. Even if the tribe is gross, you got to have one of those tribes or you are dead in the water, homie. And I would just love to give each other permission, to give you permission, my friend, to give people watching this, to give planet Earth permission to just think about crap for a while. Yes. It's okay if the equation of how does an infinite God interact with finite humanity and what role does my belief play in that? It's okay if that takes a minute. <laughs> it's okay if the, does salvation come primarily through the mediation of the church and the, the relationship with Jesus Christ as the representative of Christ on earth? Or is salvation more of a sole fide kind of expression where this direct access to God and by mm. faith alone is like, it's okay if you don't know the answer to that and you don't go out and slug it out yeah. with other Christians who do not. Like, it's just all right to think about that for a while because it's kind of important and it's kind of hard. Uh, those are excellent points. I, I couldn't agree more. Very well put. Yeah, and it's like nuance is weakness. Uh, you have to be as mm. black or as white as you can be. And so like in like a Catholic conservative circle, it's like you, you better mention devotion to the Blessed Mother within the first three minutes or else I'm curious about, you know, your allegiance or something, you know, and I'm sure something similar <laughs> with Protestantism. Um, and Yeah, we got our things. Yeah, like there's, there's stuff like that, you know, like people... Like in, I'll share about Catholicism. You can feel free to share about Protestantism, right? Um, I'm a big fan as a Catholic of, of, of saying something like this, and this is what I kind of pin to my profiles. Um, a faithful Catholic is not only one who submits to what the church teaches authoritatively, but is also one who does not demand uniformity where the church allows diversity of opinion or custom. What happens in the it's Catholic Church? Anymore. What? I just keep liking you more. Yeah. Just, I just, you keep saying words and then I keep liking you more. This is fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, like people get, like in the Catholic Church, there's a lot of devotionals, right? So you've got the rosary or you've got this particular medal or this kind of novena or this sort of, and, and when people get into a devotion that enriches their life tremendously, they can sometimes talk about that devotion as if this is a non-negotiable. But the Catholic Church doesn't actually mandate that Catholics pray the rosary. And feel free to check out my com box after the video. There's going to be people who are really upset about that. Uh, there's different mm -hmm. expressions within Catholicism, right? People who celebrate the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in the Eastern Catholic churches. Um, and so, the, yeah, there's no patience even for that kind of nuance. It's like we all have to be this one monolithic thing. And you would think in Catholicism, given that that the word broken down would mean according to the whole or colloquially universal, that we'd be okay with a sort of universal expression of faith. Like, here's another thing that's kind of funny. Like, being in a universal church means that there's going to be kind of devotions that strike me as weird. 
Like in the Philippines, there's this devotion. It's called the Infant Prague of Jesus. You should totally check it out. It's like Jesus dressed yeah, this up. This is new to me. Yeah, check it. In a little kind of dress thing with a big crown on. And I look at that, I'm like, that seems weird to me. But it's okay because not everything has to appeal to my sensibilities or particular tastes. But my the whole point in saying I mean, that is just that there's no sort of patience for any kind of nuance. Right, right, right. And I think there has to be, or the whole thing would break. And I think one of the things that we should be able to just reason our way to is if 2000 years after the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this religion still exists, it must have a little give to it because the world has changed somewhat in the last couple thousand years. And I think of installing like a floating floor. Have you ever done one of these, like a pergo floor? Yes. Like a laminate? Yep. Okay. When you do that, you do not make your cuts with that floor all the way to your drywall or to your trim. You know that that trim is going to cover a little bit of mm -hmm. space that you allow. And if you live in a diverse climate like I do, as things get more humid, as things get hotter and colder, that floor is going to expand and contract. And if you don't leave room for expansion and contraction in within a, a reasonable amount, well, then the whole thing is going to eventually warp up and just be ruined and you're going to end up having to replace the whole thing. Those traditions within Protestantism that I see thriving have just enough give to allow for that kind of diversity on things that are secondary or especially tertiary. Those expressions of Protestantism that I see falling mm -hmm. off a cliff and having very little future are those that put in their floating floor all the way out to the trim, all the way out to the walls. And then any pressure from mm -hmm. planet Earth, from culture, society, other expressions of Christianity, science. a newly discovered passage that nobody had thought about, science, and all of a sudden, boom, the whole floor is warped and that expression, it's just wrecked. And as soon as mm -hmm. the people who are in it now are dead, it's going to be gone. It's going to be over. And it seems to me that orthodoxy benefits from having a tremendous amount of flex out there at the edges. Very creedal, very doggedly determined to stick to the language of, of Chalcedon, of Isaiah. But, and that mystery clause, that mystery emphasis within orthodoxy, that allows for quite a bit of ebb and flow. And I, in my travels on the internet, run into two brands of Catholics. I definitely hear from the type that it feels like their expression of Catholicism is installed all the way to the trim and there's no room and it warps if anything happens to it. And then I run into the crowd that seems to really appreciate and lean into that, that diversity that in my estimation is allowable is not even just allowable but celebratable within catholicism and is the reason that this ancient expression of christianity continues to thrive yeah and i suppose it's helpful to when, as a catholic i think okay what does the church a catholic church what does it forbid what does it permit what does it encourage uh what does it mandate you know um and I'm sure you and I would have obviously differences of opinion as to what's fundamental and what is something that we can take or leave. But um, can't put a pin in that. Continue. It, well, you no, you go. Well, no, I was just going to say, let's find out. Like, finish the thought, but I want to find out. Uh, yeah, like, so, so, to... so, so, for example, like baptism regenerates the soul. I can't be like, well, does it though? Like, as a Catholic, that's not an option for me. But saying immersion or sprinkling or like that's an option for me now that's maybe i just thought of that off the top of my head that's not terribly profound but um sure let's take it out one more level though why does baptism regenerate the soul we've been there sorry you you broke up a little bit why does baptism regenerate the soul yeah um well because through the power of christ and through the the words of the sacrament and I would point to things like John 3, 5, you know, about being born of, uh, what is it, hudotos. I'm trying to be fancy with my Greek, hudotos kai panumatos. I see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you like that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that th th this, th this is something as a Catholic that has been, I would say, understood universally 
that this isn't something, and I, I'm not trying to get into a debate on baptism here, I'm just saying how I understand it, right? That this is something that no church father that I'm aware of, say, who commented on John 3, 5, interpreted it to mean anything other than baptism has this real effect, isn't merely symbolic, that sort of thing. And so my only point in bringing that up was to kind of show this kind of distinction between, as a Catholic, yeah. there are sort of non-negotiables, and then there are certain things that are, and I think what you're talking about when you're saying like floor all the, all the way to the wall is, I don't know, this is kind of like, I think in the face of a chaotic culture that we cannot understand or control and which we might have very little hope for, we need to, we, we want to get very bloody clear about what's black and white. Like in a world of gray, we desperately need a f black and white. You know, in, in a world in which I feel like I'm falling, I would like a foothold, please. Um, and I sort of think fundamentalism, be it Catholic or Protestant, is sort of born out of that sort of fear. Right. At least I see, I've seen yes. that in my own life. Right? I'm not even talking about other people in particular. I just see it in my own life. Like when life is out of control, yes. the bloody bins will be on the curb by Wednesday morning to be emptied. Damn it. You know what I mean? Like there's a, I, I can't control my own life and my own emotions, but I can bloody well control that. And so I think yes. uh, in, yeah. 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 I I mean, we've got our list of essentials as well. It varies a little bit from expression of Protestantism to expression of Protestantism. We, but the same thing happens. I, I think there is an insecurity, <clears throat> one, an insecurity in relationship to other Christian traditions. If their thing is right, my thing must be wrong. And that's just a bad ethic of, of a thought of ideas that, whoa, 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 there's a lot of nuance here. That is not necessarily true that right. if their thing is right, my thing could be wrong. I mean, there could be more overlap than you figure. You could both, you could both but be there's wrong. there's also, you could both be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you could both be right about enough stuff that the shaded area of the Venn diagram makes you effectively overlap as allies. And then you can have a laugh and a good time and, Enjoy the conversation about the places where you don't. Those are my favorite people to hang out with. Uh, convictional unity, right? Like, I, I, it's like the the period I went through that we were talking about a little, about a little while ago. I, I can't help but believe what I believe. I would like to yeah. believe something different sometimes, but if I don't, then I didn't. I would love to be persuaded of something I'm not persuaded of for peace at times, but if I'm not persuaded of it, I, I can't help that. And I, I, but there's, so running there's a sense. Yeah. Like there's a sense in which like there Our are delay certain is killing us. So I'm, I'm very yeah, sorry. About sorry, that. brother. Yeah. There are certain things that I can't or in theory might not be able to convince myself of, but it's based upon something that I am sufficiently convinced of. And so accept by faith, you know, and I think like for yeah. Catholics, that's kind of the nice thing about being a Catholic. It's like, OK, so there are certain teachings that I have to hold. I don't know how to figure that out right now, but I've sort of submitted my intellect to the teaching authority of the church, and so therefore I'm on board. And while I personally have trouble figuring this out, I'm going to have to look into it a little more. And I suppose you have something similar in Christianity, if the in Protestantism, if you have the Bible teaching something emphatically, you might say, well, okay, I know I have to believe this. I do believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and therefore this is going to have to fit if I'm going to maintain that belief in the inerrant word of God. Yeah, and I would say how that plays out in the mind of a Protestant, or let's just say non-Catholic Christian within the boundaries of creedalism, because, for example, Baptists would not claim to be Protestant. Um, Seventh-day Adventism, it's not really Protestant. It's, it's built a little bit different. It flows out of a different thing. So I think what you do with those difficult tensions, whether they be with the authority of the church, the local church, the authority of the text, it has a lot to do with how your historical tradition is structured and where the authority comes from. Mm -hmm. For the Eastern Church and for Western Catholicism, it's easy. It's magisterium. It's apostolic succession. It's the authority of the church. It's tradition. It's very straightforward. There is a, a centralized, unified authority that is not the only authority, but as you describe, you're reconciling your questions and struggles, your gray areas with those teachings. But within Protestantism, you've got multiple versions of mm -hmm. authority. The Anglican Church, 
would view itself as the continuing Catholic Church. So they would say, eh, we didn't leave. We're still part of the exact same thing. And no, we would still hold to all of these traditions. We would look to the church fathers and to tradition as well. And we would also have to wrestle with that kind of thing. The reformers, the, the reformed traditions born out of Calvinism, John Knox, characters like that, they would say the supreme authority is the text and that the text can be systematized and solved. And so any friction you have is going to be with the text or with the distillation of the text into a confession like Westminster. It's the obvious one that comes to mind. So you're not wrestling against the Westminster divines. You're wrestling against that document and the shorter catechism that everybody's going through in that tradition. But once all of the apostolic authority real estate was taken up, and then once all of the biblical systematizing authority real estate was taken up after the 16th and 17th century, you get into the 18th century and the 19th century, and there's nowhere to go if you feel like you need to start a new church. And so then you get non-Catholic expressions of Christianity that are rooted in a new apostolic mm -hmm. succession. Yeah, I Joseph had a vision Smith. while I was on my farm and God told me, you went specific, I went vague. God told <laughs> me where to get this new information and I got it. And so I am theologically descended from the apostle Paul. God speaks through me and I am going to give you this new truth that sort of corresponds with the Bible and people who wrestle in that kind of a tradition, which I'm very wary of, are are going to have to wrestle with the Bible and the claims of the Apostle Skip or Gary or whatever his name is in that situation. But then furthermore, you've also got expressions of non-Catholicism where what you're wrestling with is what truth you believe is coming through the sign gifts and the spiritual devotional experiences you're having with the Holy Spirit in church and throughout the week. Now, those last few things I described, that's not really my expression of historical Christianity. I'm from this teeny tiny little sliver of Scandinavian free church history where we're really into the life of the mind. We're into the church fathers. We're into historical creedal Christianity. We would not think of Christianity as starting in 1517 after a 1500 year pause in the action. Um, we view ourselves as profoundly connected with all of that and profoundly grateful that expressions of Christianity we might not agree with on every single detail did such a great job of taking care of the text, of nurturing the life of the mind, of preserving the thoughts and the beliefs of the Christians on whose shoulders we stand. So, so for me, what I'm wrestling with as a Christian from my narrow little sliver of sort of Protestantism is uh, Rome, historically. I'm wrestling with the Eastern Church Fathers. I'm wrestling with the creeds. I'm wrestling with the text. I'm wrestling with other apostolic claims that are more recent and potentially dubious. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is Protestantism, as you know, is not monolithic. Right. And there's something I find really enviable about what you're saying, which is, yeah. man, I know exactly what, what I am wrestling with, whereas yeah. mine is so multifaceted and <laughs> confusing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that could either be seen as a sort of, well, gee, isn't that nice for you? Uh, but it just so happens that that isn't how the, the Christian expression, you know, ought to have evolved. Or, you know, from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, it is nice. And maybe this is the way it was supposed to be. Because, I mean, one of the things Thomas Aquinas talks about is, you know, there are certain things that we can know through philosophy. There are certain things we could only know through divine revelation, right? So, uh, Aquinas mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church teaches that we can come to a knowledge that there is a God through examining the world around us, um, but that God decided to reveal himself to us, even that, even in that sense of his existence, because if, if we were left to our own devices, we would either not come to know that he exists, not have the time to sort of study philosophy and metaphysics, come to all sorts of errors about this God that like he has a body or something like that. Um, mm. And so it's really great that God has revealed himself to us and revealed what it is we need to know for our salvation in a way so that we don't, we don't have to figure it all out for ourselves. And I suppose 
those things that I would consider like, no, this is something we should know and submit to. And, and your, this is something we should know and submit to are probably, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine you would think your, you probably have fewer things than I do as a, as a Catholic. I often find that when I'm engaging with a Protestant, it's like, I have more to lose than you do in one sense, right? Because if I talk to you about why praying to the saints can be sort of reconciled with scripture and how, yes, there was development in the early church, but it was adopted somewhat soon. And you say, okay, yeah, cool. I'm down with that. Well, you're still a Protestant. You know what I mean? So like you can accept a lot more of my beliefs than I can accept of yours, because if I start accepting yours, then I'm, I'm no longer Catholic. Or as if you accept many <laughs> right. of mine, you know, other than say the papacy or something, then you can remain one of those Protestants. Well, I accept the papacy. I mean, the papacy is one of the historical patriarchs of the historical centers of Christianity and is one of those roles that has profoundly contributed to the history of theology. And I think as a Protestant, one of the most commendable things that comes out of the role of the papacy, uh, apart from you know the things that normally get brought up by Protestants, which are it justifiably critiqued. The papacy hasn't always had good days, but I think one of the best things that's come out of it is somebody had to have the buck stop with them. Somebody had to navigate the unavoidable melding of church and state in Christendom for a thousand years and had to figure out practical theological solutions, just as you talked about that wrestling. They, they had to wrestle. They had to figure out a way to resolve these things. And I, I know that the Pope does not always speak ex cathedra, does not always speak absolutely infallibly authoritatively. There's a whole lot of things that Popes have said that every Catholic would reject. Every Catholic would reject. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that falls in that in-between place where this is a innovative, practical, fits within the boundaries of historical Catholic orthodoxy solution that actually resolves a gigantic crisis and everybody's better for that practical thinking on the part of, of Rome, on the part of the Vatican. And I think it's okay from the outside looking in to be historically grateful yeah. for those moments of practical solutions. As but a you, Protestant, yeah. I don't have to wrestle with that stuff because we've never been in charge to that degree. So my Scandinavian free church tradition, we never ran Scandinavia. We don't have to fix any of that or reconcile any of that. We didn't have to make theological decisions that were that were built for practical, temporal, right. societal management. But, but so see, just, but see when, when, you, when you say you accept the papacy, you mean you accept it here, uh, historically and you see the value it played in church history. That's obviously different to say, saying you accept the papacy as it stands today and it's... You see what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I see. I, I like what you're doing, though. I, I mean, I think it's important that whenever we have a disagreement, um, we begin by by pointing out how we agree. You know, like meeting where we can is always a good idea. Yes, I do not believe that God is the sun and the papacy is the moon, who reflects with accuracy the reality of the sun in everything. I I, I don't view it as a Protestant as being such a unique role. I also don't share the Protestant. Uh, any of my friends and brothers who are proud that the Pope is the Antichrist and nothing right. redemptive has come from that place. Like, that's just not where yeah. I land on those issues. So like for you, when you engage with Catholics and Orthodox, is there a sense in which like, you're like, yeah, no, I, I, am, I am actually open to becoming a Catholic or do you more, do, have you pretty much settled that no, but I can see the value in many of the things you do and am willing to adopt some of those things I find beneficial. Yeah, closer to the latter. Um, yeah. It, it's just, it's not new to me. And I think maybe it's the way I do the videos and that I don't want to go tell someone else what they believe. I want to ask and I want to hear how they would say it That's cool, and what yeah. they think. But <clears throat> I, it, it's... It's not like I'm, I, look, I have a ton to learn. I don't know most things in the world, obviously. <laughs> but, but I mean, this is what I do. This is what I care about is historical theology. So, so it's not like I swing by a Catholic church and just have an off-the-cuff conversation 
with a priest or I talk with one of my clergy friends from within Catholicism and they're like, oh yeah, well, this is what we believe in why. And I'm like, what? Oh, oh, well that, that is okay. I, wow. What am I doing? How do, do I some... convert? For the most you... part, it's like, oh no. Okay. I better understand the cohesiveness of your system. It's just that none of those things strike to those handful of core assumptions gotcha. that, yeah, that would yeah. cause me to, to say, oh yeah, well, Catholicism makes the most sense and I want to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and do you, I, I imagine you'd get tired of people in your YouTube comment section saying things like, become Orthodox, become Catholic. You're like, this isn't <laughs> helpful, so but unhelpful. thank you do for you dropping that? by. Do you get become oh, Lutheran? Sure. <laughs> no, but I definitely get become Orthodox and, um, you know, yeah. things like that, you know. And it's like, okay. Do you ever well, reply to those? Uh, <laughs> I should do it in a sort of snarky way. Like, dude, no one's ever put it that way before, but now you say it. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I do that sometimes. I do that exact response. Dude, like, oh, yeah. wow. I, I, oh, orthodoxy I have... is truth. Well, I just had no idea. But now that you've commented that here, I, uh, I guess yeah. it's time for me to immediately convert. You know, here's something I want to bring up that I think has to do with what we're talking about. You know, we live in a multicultural, multi-faith society. We don't live in 13th century, you know, Italy. Um, we live on streets with atheists and Jews maybe, and maybe Muslims or Protestants, different versions of Protestantism. And so we're, we're having to kind of wrestle with things that perhaps people didn't have to in the past. It would be a lot easier to be like, we're right, that's the heretic. Um, and that still might be the case, but I mean, that kind of like black and white worldview, it, it's difficult to maintain that when you are encountering people who prima facie seem just as rational and as good as you are, and they have what, at least it, again, on the face of it, appears to be coherent. They they have a they have a different narrative that seems to make sense of the data of human experience. And so it's like, what yeah. what do I what do I do with that? Um, how <clears throat> I'm, I'm saying a lot of things, um, but you know, how confidently am I to hold my worldview? Given that there are there exist people who could question me into the ground and and make me seem like an idiot, and it, okay, so then what options do I have? Okay, am I not to hold a worldview? Well, that is one. Am I to hold one mm -hmm. loosely, uh, thinking constantly that anything will give at any point? Okay, but that's mm -hmm. sort of self refuting too, because there's obviously people who could talk mm -hmm. you into the ground about why you're wrong about holding your worldview loosely. Do you see what I'm sort of approaching? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Good. I feel like that's the conundrum of the moment, my friend. Yeah, me too. We, we had this vision that if you put us all in a room together globally, it would totally work. We were doing this <laughs> melting pot thing where it's like, let's put our ideas together. Let's put everybody together from all over the world. And America will lead the way. The West will lead the way. And... We've got this new notion of liberal tolerance that got us through the 19th and 20th centuries a little bit clunky, but we defeated evil and the last of the global authoritarians. And let's just make a device that lets us all be in the same room together. And it should move us toward utopia with better understanding of each other. And it has not done that. It has not delivered on those promises, even though I really like the internet because it allows things like this to happen. Mm -hmm. I think we're still in the shock and awe phase of the internet where we had no idea how differently other people saw it. We had, I mean, is it any coincidence that the views in the West toward Islam have shifted so much in the last 20 years? Nobody ever talked to a Muslim 20 years ago. And so now you look at it and I, I think people in the West are much more equipped to be like, oh, well, there's that kind of Muslim thought. Mm -hmm. And then there's that kind of Islam. And then, whoa, that's the kind I saw in Tom Clancy movies. Okay, I do recognize that. But I didn't know any of this other stuff existed at all. And then, yeah, you have to reconcile that. And furthermore, I don't think most Protestants knew any Catholics. I, I mean, I still hear 2001 caricatures of Protestantism. Oh, Martin Luther ripped books out of the Bible. We don't have a pope. He can't do that. That didn't happen. That's 1990s Catholic apologetics. Stop with that. But I, you still hear that from Protestants, from Catholics, from Orthodox. 
these old lines that people threw around during the youth group age of the 1980s and 1990s. And now you hear them and they just feel like relics. Like, <clears throat> well, you can just go ask a Lutheran. I mean, you have the internet. You can even go find a German Lutheran in Germany. It's not that hard anymore. And you can just find out what they think and have a civilized conversation and a drink and it'll be fine. Yeah. And so what's happening is that we are, I think we are just right now, my friend, seeing the inflection point where we emerge from the shock and awe moment of, oh, crap, people don't think what I think, and they're not as stupid as I'd been told. And, and as everybody else makes sort of sense, and as I'd hoped, yes. And if everybody else makes sense, then the things I think can't be real, and I'm freaking out here a little bit, and you know what? Screw the whole thing. I'm just not even going to be religious anymore then. If there are going to be this many options, I'm just out. I'm going to deconstruct and further... I'm going to declare my independence from this confusing religious thing I used to do by holding the exact opposite views on every single issue with passion and vitriol and with religious fervor. But I think we are seeing the end of what can be accomplished with that kind of response. At some point in the age of the internet, we will move past the shock and awe moment and we will have to reconcile what we think with what everybody else thinks. We will have to figure out a new public ethic of tolerance like we had to figure out coming out of the age of absolute monarchs during the Enlightenment. You're going to have to figure out how to coexist with people. Now, I think we have two great answers for that. One is, is the gospel and the forgiveness and patience of Christ that comes with it. And the other is liberalism. I know people hear that and they're like, oh, liberalism, like you mean like things that people who vote differently than me think. I just mean classical western secular tolerance where you don't hurt other people or mess with their stuff because of their ideas you do you me do me and we disagree where we disagree we agree where we agree and we live peaceably together make each other prosperous by doing business voluntarily together these are good options that can get us past all of this but it's not a surprise to me that we blinking stepped into the light of the internet, immediately panicked and freaked out at what we saw coming out of everybody else's mouths, had 20 years of division and hostility and anger that bled over into our politics. It ruined our art. It, it just wrecked everything. But we can't do that forever. Everybody's tired of it. Everybody's sick of it. Religious people, not religious people. And I think what happens next is we move toward that impulse of, of reconciliation, reconciliation with people, reconciliation in our own brains, with what we do with ideas that are different than ours. I think there's going to be an impulse coming up to say, okay, you think baptism is salvific. I don't. But if Jesus didn't die on the cross, you don't think baptism is salvific. So we agree on the thing before it, for sure. sure and yeah. we can explore that and then have fun again a pleasant drink and conversation about how that how it's christ applied. on the cross might be meted out to people yeah, yeah, and yeah. what role the church plays in that and at the end i like i'm just completely at ease at this point with a high five over that i totally understand <laughs> your position i like you i think that works i got this other one and i think we're good here let's move yeah. forward i think that's the age we're coming into and i hope friendships like this one uh, help to make those things happen yeah, that's that's really interesting stuff. And, and I suppose I like what you said there about the kind of 90s relics or things we heard in youth group. And I'd be interested to see how many of those you think I would hold. I, I suppose there might be some and, uh, you know, um, but that's the whole point of talking to each other, right? To sort of disavow ourselves of characters and straw men. Um, yeah. And, you and this, do, it? Let's, do you remember any of that 90s apologetic stuff about well, Protestantism? OK, um, you want to do Sola Scriptura? Uh, sure, we think that. Yeah, yeah. So, depending like, on what you mean by that, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. So for me, and and again, please you know, forgive me if this comes off as, as you put it, kind of like '90s youth group stuff, because that isn't what I'm trying to do as I as I bring this up. So I know this isn't a new yeah, idea to you. to you. So it's all yeah, good. yeah, yeah. It's like I'm not good. trying to stump you with this, but this as a Catholic sort of makes sense to me, right? It's like. Uh, you have this collection of books, 73 or 66, and it doesn't mm -hmm. sort of um, come with an inspired index. 
Uh, and so you need mm -hmm. to, f if you want to say that Matthew's inspired or Galatians or Hebrews is inspired, how is it you're going to come to that opinion when there were multiple texts floating around the first and second century, some of which were considered canonical? And it seems to make sense to me that if you have an authoritative church, you can get an answer. But if you don't, then sola scriptura in that narrow sense seems to me like self-referentially incoherent. Like, I don't know how you do that. Um, I, I don't know how you don't end up just becoming the authority that determines what is and what isn't canonical. You can look to fallible men in the past and see what they thought, but if they're only fallible and can't make any sort of definitive statement, I'm not sure how it is you can come to the conclusion that the Bible you have on your desk there is uh, is inspired. And and you pointed out Martin Luther. Now, the the first sort of canonical list comes from Pope Lee. When is that? Three a Council at Rome. I want to say 321 or something like that. Um, Pope Damasus the first. first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pope, Pope Damasus the first Roman first. official list. Okay, well there you go. Yeah, fair enough. But see, this this because, this I mean, has the, the festal letter is floating around, and you've got even the Mauritanian canon. You've got even the heretical canon. Um, right, but this comes from a. I mean, you 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 probably know century. you probably know more about this than me. But the my understanding is you've got a pope, uh, Pope Damasus the first. Council of Rome 381? Gosh, I forget. And and he's he's got a list that 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 seems to be the here's the authoritative canon, and that's what Catholics have today. Um, and then that's mm -hmm. ratified by Carthage and Hippo, and then obviously finally in Trent we're in a, as a response to the mm -hmm. Protestant Reformation. But um mm -hmm. all right, I, I I've shared enough there, but but um it, yeah, it, it seems to me that that having a church that's infallible makes sense. I don't see how Protestants get sort of inerrant books and can be that confident of it. It seems like, and here's a little, here's a little line for you that you might be, that might seem a little cute, and it is, and that's that the, the, the Bible is not an instruction manual for a church still in shrink wrap, right? But the, but the, the, the Bible presupposes a church already in existence. And, you, and of course you know that. Yeah. Of course you agree with that, but yeah. I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that's a really well articulated expression <laughs> of what I understand the Catholic position to be. Yep. And again, I think within the boundaries of a certain set of assumptions, that is going to make the most sense. And why wouldn't you think that from the outside perspective looking in, given the benefit of a couple thousand years of church history, the Protestant would look back and say, mm -hmm. uh, authoritative, infallible church decision whoa, like, I don't really want to go through the laundry list because I don't want people doing that to me and I have a laundry list. But, I mean, yikes, we had multiple popes denouncing each other from multiple holy sees in the 14th century. The tradition seems to get disrupted at times. There's not agreement at times. Theology certainly evolves. I would view that as a strength of the Catholic Church. But the Protestant position or response would be, Okay, first of all, we hold a different assumption on the authoritativeness of one unique church body and a different position on just the track record. It seems like there are enough exceptions to this accuracy that uh, it just that, that doesn't strike the outsider as compelling. Mm -hmm. The second part of the response that I think you would usually hear, and I, I think I think this, would be that the, the canon was discovered. The canon was but for the bind on earth, bind in heaven, loose on earth, loose in heaven, authority of one branch of the church. And I, again, I know it's nails on a chalkboard to some of your Catholic listeners, and I, I don't mean it that way. I'm just trying to articulate the position. And we would say, well, scripture presupposes scripture. I mean, within the epistles, we see Peter and Paul acknowledging other scripture as scripture, even by name at one point. Revelation seems to right. presuppose that other stuff that's already been written is scripture. The Gospels definitely assume that the Old Testament canon is scripture with very few missing citations. Uh, we would look at yeah. the deuterocanonical yeah. literature and say, oh, the nature of the allusions or references there are entirely different in spirit and in uh, set-aside quotation form. 
then the reference is directly to the agreed upon uh, canon between uh, Jews, Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox that agreed upon mm -hmm. canon. Anything referenced there is pretty uniquely referenced. So we would say there there is uh, some indexing that goes on, but I would agree with you that there there's limitedness. It's not like you get a, a table of contents on the New Testament. But at the same time, it's not tough for me to go and look at who the late first century, early to mid second century church fathers, look at who they're quoting, look at who they're talking about. If the church seems to have had a really clear sense of what were the gospels long before there was any concentration of power in Rome. And by long before, I mean like the amount of time the United States has existed as a country before mm -hmm. there was clarity on these are the gospels and these over here ain't. The church wasn't powerful enough in the early first century to suppress a an early version of the Gospel of Thomas. They couldn't have killed it. They didn't have the ability or the network or the authority oh, to right. just yeah. burn the books or make it go away. That's anachronistic. It's not until much, much later that you can even imagine that any organization in Europe could have controlled thought or words so much. We just don't see that happening. And as evidence, I would cite the the early persecutions where they couldn't make the Bible go away and they had the full authority of Rome, the empire, the, the army. So yeah. now the fact that these other books slide to the back burner isn't threatening. I think the only ones where there is a question would be those those books like uh, Shepherd and the DDK, sure. where how they're being employed, you raises a question, are they being employed in the same way as scripture is employed. I mean, the DDK overlaps a ton with Matthew, where Matthew is extrapolated as sort of a, a book of services in the DDK. So I, I don't find it weird or threatening at all that people found that distillation of church practice to be useful or effective. But even the teachings there on baptism are not as neatly historically Catholic or Protestant as probably so, either of us would like them to be. So it just seems like there's clarity with the exception of a couple of books that both Catholics and eventually Protestants ended up regarding in the New Testament as not being authoritative or scripture anyway, but useful right. for, for teaching or review. And so the, the Protestant position would simply be, we think that canon was incredibly evident long before the Council of Rome, uh, Hippo or Carthage, especially Trent, and that what was happening there was a formalization of things that were already so evident that any other decision than that so would have caused for you, church then, mutiny. When somebody says, you know, oh, I see. Yeah. So for you, when you're like, well, how do you know Hebrews is scripture or something? You say, well, I, I can look to the early church and I can see quite early what was decided upon as scripture. And I accept, I mean, I'm not sure if it was you, mouth, but you're accepting the authority of those early Christians and what they decided scripture was, not so much what a sort of authoritative place within that community of believers would say it's more just the believers as a whole the kind of consensus they came up with some protestants would get really bent out of shape about that but i briefly described my little narrow sliver of tradition and right, i wouldn't right. get bent out of shape about that at all yeah, I think yeah we stand yeah. on the shoulder because the you got fathers. that's right you got different you got different protestants obviously some would say it's like self self-authenticating and these sorts of things and you, i don't think you'd say that this idea that i yeah. read it and i just know in my gizzards that it's inspired <laughs> yeah, and, and you hear that, again, that's a, one of those, we've got dozens of lame 90s anti-Catholic apologetics that we got told in youth group that just simply don't hold up and aren't a fair characterization of Catholicism and are easily parried and, and counterattacked. Yeah. But this is one that I hear a lot that I feel the same way about coming from the Catholic side. It's, well, uh, Protestants believe that a you know, little baby naked angels just lowered the Bible from heaven out of nowhere and like, I'm sure there's some kind Protestant person who likes Christian songs and stuff and has a mug that has a Bible verse on it and they'd rather not think about it and that's what they believe. Mm -hmm. But no, that would not be the historical Protestant position. Uh, no, we think there was a process that involved the work of the Holy Spirit, the authority of Jesus endorsing, um, commissioning even different writing, as well as the measure of internal consistency and uh, this is very catholic i think but apostolic authority behind those various texts so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your your historical protestant is going to have about six or seven tests for canonicity and 
down at the bottom, I think a lot of us would acknowledge, look, like even Rome confirmed this. Like, so this is a place where we should be high-fiving, not so getting grouchy with This other. is why we should be. It's sort of like when you get into an argument, how the first important thing to do is to clarify what it is you mean by that thing you're saying. Um, yeah. And it's in a similar way, I think Catholics make the mistake of thinking of Protestantism as a monolithic whole, as opposed to recognizing the, the different nuances and variations of Protestants that there are. Um, so you'll see kind of Catholics say you've got either the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist or the complete more kind of Baptist idea that this is merely a symbol without taking into consideration mm -hmm. the different ways different Protestants might explain it as being Christ's presence or something like that. So point is, I'm just trying to say is, um, as satisfying as it is to sort of sort of think I already know what you mean before telling you why that thing that you think is wrong. It's, it, 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 and it's, and it's less, less satisfying in a sort of trivial sense, but, but to rather be like, okay, so explain to me this and actually try to understand what the other person's saying, which it's like, that's the opposite of what social media is for. You know, like social media yeah. doesn't exist for like long form thought out questions and getting to know what it is you mean. It, it, it exists to slam dunk on people by quote tweeting them and making them yes. look stupid. Yeah. I saw a, I was driving through uh, Pittsburgh yesterday and I saw a billboard, I don't know, some kind of, uh, some government worker or some person that was slamming and they said, this guy voted for you to be in traffic. And I'm like, what a jerk. <laughs> like, I hate I mean, traffic. I'm against that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, well, and all go. of that stuff comes back to to that phenomenon you and I were discussing just a little bit ago. It it forces the flag planting. Yeah. If I've only got a few sentences that anybody's going to bother to read and that the app will even allow me to post, mm. well, I better make it hot. If I want people to pay attention to me and I want to seat at the table, I better come in hot. Because you and I both know coming in hot is way more productive in terms of views and the algorithm mm -hmm. yep. and traffic in general. Coming in patient, right? <laughs> rarely <laughs> goes viral. You're going to get patient level <laughs> results. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't get it done. It doesn't get clicks. And and so social media, just the way it's built, is it's made to empower people who demand you plant that flag right now. And so I hey, hear constantly uh, uh, from Protestants who are mad that I like you and that I like Catholicism. And though and this, I, I'm probably not going to convert right now, I just like it. It's funny, as as you were saying that, I took a look to the comment section and there's a guy here, Wes, oh, whoops, do you see that on your screen? Wow, what's happened? This is terrifying. Here we go. This guy's like, where do things get debatey? I'm a bit behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like, yeah, I get I, it. I don't that know. Is, do you think we're going to continue to disappoint? It's just way more interesting. Um, well, yeah. can I tell you what I'm interested in? All right. Like here, here's what I want, man. Um, I've been thinking about that question a lot lately. What do you want? Mm. Like really deeply, what do I want? Mm. Why am I doing this? Okay, let's do it. One, I would like to make a living. I, I have a family and I love them. I think it's my biological and theological responsibility to provide for them. I want my kids to thrive. I want to give them opportunities. I want time. I want flexibility, primarily because I, I really like my wife. We're in a beautiful place in our relationship right now. I, I just like being with her. I like hanging out and thinking and being close to her. I love being with my kids. They're all in that everything sticks phase of learning. I want to teach them all everything. I want to give them everything. So I, I want enough money to make my family go. Mm -hmm. I want enough time to have relationships with my wife and my kids and the people that I deeply love. I want to fill my head with the best ideas of the smartest people who I might happen to agree with or disagree with from ages past. They made their knowledge and their process available to me and I want it. Those are things I want deeply personally. Fourth thing that I want in a more existential sense is peace. I just don't wanna feel like I'm in a fight with everybody anymore. That's what I spent my teens and my twenties on. I'm right, everybody else is an idiot. There's only one way. Everything must be binary. I'm just tired, man. I, I, I don't think that's a reflection of truth or reality. 
I think the nuance is where the beauty happens and where honesty and friendship happens and where laying your head on the pillow at night and feeling at peace with your neighbors and with the world happens. So I want that. Here's the thing I want though from all of this business that I'm doing that I sense that you are doing. And that is, I don't wanna put it back together. I don't think that would be good for Christianity. I don't wanna pretend that everything that names Christ would best fit right under the same heading. I think if we did that, it would erode the effectiveness and credibility of whatever heading we all crammed under, be it orthodoxy, be it uh, Catholicism, which version of Catholicism, let's say Western, be it the Baptistic thought or Reformed thought. It would wreck the effectiveness of that thing if we all crammed under there. What I want is to get to a place where we experience real convictional unity. I cannot help but think the things I think. What you are saying makes sense on every level. The fact that I don't think the things you think is not a rejection of what you think. We have a, a few key distinctions. Also, I was born in a certain place to certain parents. I've read certain books. I was exposed to certain things. You add all of that up, and what, what I believe, it, it's just what makes sense to me. It it does not mean that it is universally and finally correct, but man, it is a great vessel for me, given all of those variables I can't change, to encounter within the boundaries of historical, creedal, orthodox Christianity to encounter Christ mm. and to live out my life as a Christian in a way that I hope is effective and redemptive and beautiful. Yep, 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 yep. I don't need my version of Christianity to ultimately win and triumph over everyone else's thing for me to feel right or like I get to go to heaven. What I want, what I yearn for is to get to a place where we craft a different ethic in the age of the internet that enables us to be together without necessarily having to solve every last thing. I just don't think we're gonna solve it without burning each other down or without blood. I think what is far more prudent is to develop a new ethic, a third way, that is not, I wholesale agree with whatever you think, I just want to get along, or I wholesale reject whatever you think, and I will fight you to the very end to destroy yeah, yeah. you so that my thing might win. I want a third way, and I want it bad. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for, for saying that, and I love just your honesty about, you know, I, I want time with my family, I want peace, and 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 I wholly concur with all those things, and I just I just love the vulnerability there. I think that's that's beautiful. Um, let me say the more antagonistic thing first and then backtrack from that. Like, I want you to be exactly. Catholic. You know, I I want people to be Catholic. I think Catholicism is the full, fullest expression of Christianity that God wants for Christians. That is what I think. Now, I'm not able to defend all of those things to everybody I've ever met, but I don't know anybody who's able to defend all the tenets of the thing that they hold. But I don't think that that has to come about through a way that diminishes our reach and effectiveness. I think it's clear Christ prayed that we would be one. You know, St. Paul, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, like is excoriating them for the divisiveness within them, uh, within that body. You know, uh, did, you know, were you baptized in the name of Paul? That sort of thing. I think the divisions among Christianity aren't something to celebrate in, in one sense, right? I think they weaken our witness to the world. This lack of unity is a problem. But um, I, think we, I think we also agree because I, I'm not saying a sort of false unity. I mean, we kind of began earlier in this discussion when I talk about Catholicism, I'm talking about this sort of universal church. And there are certain things that you have to accept. I think your list, your sort of circle of things or list of things that you would want people to accept is probably smaller than mine. But if you can accept the fact that you probably, right, want your Muslim neighbor to come to know Jesus Christ and to abandon Islam, like I would hope that's what you think. Yeah. So like I do think that. Yeah. yeah. But and you hold that, but not in like a jerk way, not in a violent way, not in a I'm uninterested in listening to you or learning from you way. So like just like you hold that towards the Muslim, I would hope that as I say something like that, which I hope wasn't too abrasive, but whatever, is that I want Protestants it's to not. be Catholic. Yeah, what Protestants be Catholic. I hope it's not in that abrasive, jerky, triumphalist, I can't learn anything from you anyway kind of way. Because I don't, I don't feel that way. Like what I'm about to say might sound pandering, and I don't know, maybe it is, but I, I, I think there's also truth in it. Like 
I know Protestant Christians who put me to shame and, and who teach me to have a, like one of the, those people is John Eldridge from, from Wild at Heart. Love the man. I know the guy. Yeah. 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 Love, love him. Love him. You know, and says things I disagree with, but he also teaches me about how to grow in my intimacy with Jesus Christ. I've got friends in Portland, Oregon, who uh, put me to shame with their daily scripture reading and things like this. So, so I guess all of that to say um, that I think, I think our lack of unity does weaken our witness to the world. And I think that we can, and I think the Lord does want us to be one and wants a sort of unity among essentials. But then I suppose the question then is like, what's essential and what isn't? And that's where we disagree. Yeah, a couple of, one, I appreciate all of that. I appreciate that you want me to be Catholic. I mean, I mean what a be, be disappointing weird if I thing it would be it? if you believed what you believe about Catholicism and didn't want me to be it. Yeah. I, I'm quite <laughs> certain that Almost everyone won't like my answer to what you said there. But to your point that you want me to be Catholic, my response would be, I am. I'm absolutely a part of the universal church. Now, I don't happen to agree with all of the historical precedents that caused a certain expression of Catholicism to land on Rome as having some sort of unique centrality. I'm not persuaded of that biblically. As a historian, I'm not persuaded of that necessity. That's why I would tip my hat to Rome and say, hey, I'd, I'd give a whole lot more credit there than most Protestants who are going off of 90s apologetics critiques. I see the necessity of the role. I appreciate the role. I just don't view it as uniquely holding the binding and loosing powers described in Matthew chapter 16. I just, I just don't see that connection. And that is one of those key assumptions that is a very significant jumping off point one way or the other. If you are persuaded of that, then I'm not Catholic. But if you're not persuaded of the uniqueness of that historical claim, well, heck yeah, I'm Catholic. And I have within myself the latitude within the creeds, within the historical teachings to say, I'm skeptical about that. And the reason I'm skeptical about that is because I don't view that particular chair or those chairs surrounding it as having the unique authority to ultimately and finally decide that. Now, the 90s Catholic apologetic that I know you don't think, but you heard this one growing up and I heard it too, would be, oh, so you guys just make up whatever you want. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, there right, are versions right, right. of Christianity that do that, but no, have you ever met a reformed Christian? They can't just make up whatever they want. I mean, the, the theological box and system and precision that they have, whether I agree with all of it or not, no, they can't just make up whatever they want. It's not some loosey-goosey thing. It's incredibly precise and theologically binding. They have a process for it, and they would cite authority for that. And they're the authority that a Reformed Geneva-style Christian would cite would overlap in, in majority with the authority that uh, a Catholic theologian would point to. And the key distinction here is what do we do with those five patriarchies and what do we believe about the historical shaking out of where the authority that Christ clearly vested the church with, where does that authority truly lie and how does it manifest? Mm -hmm. That is a key ecclesial distinction that exists between my little slice of Protestantism, I can't speak for everybody, and a Catholic. And I, I know how offensive, even odious, even I'm turning off this dang video, this guy seemed nice, but I'm done. That yeah, kind of I, comment is for me. No, uh, yeah, we have Catholicism. You all. can't say you're Catholic. But oh, I see. But yeah. I am. Well, I, I think... myself as Catholic. I'm Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, and obviously, there's different senses in which we use the term, and so I would agree with you in one sense and not in the other. Sure, you know, and I'm at, I'm yeah. at peace with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll sleep tonight. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> um. Okay, what do you want to do now? Because we we have a lot of people who have kind of comments and questions. I don't know if you need to go hang out with that beautiful wife of yours, or if you want to take a few what of these now. Or... Been... No, nah, let's just do it. I got a little time. I'm getting hungry. All right, but, yeah, yeah, me too, dude. One. I haven't eaten today. We got a super chat here. Golly, I've got to do better at this, man. Can you see what I'm doing on this screen? I can get some of it. Yeah, I'm. Tr yeah, I can't. It's it's my fault. Here we go. Ready, set, boom, boom. Okay, super chat guy says, as for Sola Scriptura. 
you're an idiot. No, he doesn't say that. This is the <laughs> only way to discern false doctrine. Jesus doesn't change, so any new doctrine must be in line with Scripture. What? Jesus doesn't change, so any new doctrine. How do you read that question? I think it sounds like what he's saying is, if basically the Protestant position, that if something is incongruent with Scripture, then I'm not... I'm not going to accept it. Or if something is in contradiction with the explicit or even implicit mandates of Scripture, then I think he might be a Protestant. I got an idea. How about I answer right. the ones that are critiques of Catholicism and you yep. answer the ones that are critiques of Protestantism? That's fine with me. Can I try it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me give this thing a shot. Um, oh, yeah, so this, the this, this fellow, is, this fellow is, is a Protestant. This fellow is a Protestant because he's got to follow up, but you go for it. Okay, I would say to uh, to this comment that sometimes the text is abundantly evident in terms of what it teaches. Is there some other way other than Christ? No, he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. Uh, did God make things or did someone else make things? God made things. Did Jesus Christ participate fully in, cre in creation? Colossians 1, John 1, there's no argument on these points. And so I would think that if the bishop of rome stepped out tomorrow and was like hey new thing uh this is authoritative this one counts it turns out <laughs> jesus christ did not fully participate in creation he's the first and greatest created being of the father he's still worthy of worship but mm, the bible doesn't mean that anymore that's not what we believe catholics would revolt you can't yes. do stuff like that with the things that are utterly foundational and christian within catholicism where it gets trickier, and the reason I think we got to be a little bit patient on this point, is that the history of the church is a very big one and a very diverse one. And even as Protestants, we have to admit that we look at several of these texts, and some of them are more difficult than others. Many are right through the front door and straightforward. But I understand the appeal of the high church Catholic system in saying where there is confusion or challenge leave the interpretation to the magisterium, we will get this one. How did I do on the Catholic side? How did I do? Yeah, I think it's fun. Um, no heresy there? Well, I I, I just, I kind of like the idea of you responding and me not having to critique you. So I, I was just thinking I'd just let you speak and then I'd go to the next one, honestly. Okay, I should, I, we can do more. that. Yeah, let's do that. So, but see, so here's an answer. So this is the same bloke. He says, for instance, why would Jesus say in John 14, 6 that he's the only way to the Father and then later tell us to go through Mary? God doesn't contradict. Yeah, so I mean, there's so much can be said here. Like, one thing I find that's helpful to do, like for Catholics when they speak to Protestants about Mary, is to begin by saying what they don't mean. So, just like a Protestant or Catholic, if they are to speak to a Muslim who's convinced we worship three gods, the first thing you do is say what you don't mean. And that's the sort of guardrails, the sort of bumpers, the kind of bumper bowling. It's like, well, somewhere in between here, but it can't go over here. Uh, right. And so I think it's yeah. important that Catholics, I agree, like if I were, I, I think I can see, and maybe, maybe I can't because I've always been Catholic, but I, I can appreciate a Protestant being like, dude, this looks a lot like idolatry. I see that you say that it's not, but there's a ton of candles burning before her statue and just seems like you guys are way too into it. Like I get it. She was his mom and she was probably super cool and stuff, but you need to chill a little. Like I can totally, I think I can totally appreciate that. So I think the first thing I would say- yeah, I went to a church one time where they were where they were kissing pictures of Jesus and Mary mm -hmm. and there were way more lip marks on Mary. So- Yeah, you, you know, know why I think, I think that is? I, I think that's a sort of a natural tendency to be more affectionate to the feminine. Like, honestly, I just, I think that's just, like, I think people like devotions to Mary because maybe they've had a bad experience with men. Or, you know, like, I honestly think there's some natural explanation that can go along with that. But anyway, so I think the first thing to say is like, Catholics don't worship Mary. Uh, we think that Mary is nothing or less than nothing compared to he who is. Uh, but we think that just like we can ask earthly Christians to pray for us, we also think that we can have heavenly Christians pray for us. And so in that sense, uh, just like I can go through you to Jesus by asking you to pray for me or my wife or something like that, I can go through Mary to ask her to intercede for me. I think Catholics and Protestants, we've been divided for like 500 years. There's obviously a lot of differences in our language and how we use terms, and we should be aware of that when we talk about things. And I think one of those words would be like pray. 
You know, like when a Catholic uses the word pray, he doesn't always mean it synonymous with worship. He might mean it in a sort of old English sense when you say yeah. like, I pray I thee, I ask thee, you know. Now that doesn't mean I'm right mm -hmm. to do it. It's just, I think it's important to kind of make some clarifying statements. There you go. Yeah, whereas a, when a Protestant thinks of prayer, especially a Protestant in the last hundred years, they're going to think of the Acts acrostic. You guys have this in Catholicism? Yeah, yeah. The order for prayer, adoration, confession, oh, thanksgiving, no. I, 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 Yes, no, I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. And so if, if you're praying right, you know, and I think this is a, a reasonable biblical distillation of, of what prayer to God is. You adore God, you confess your sins, you offer thanksgiving, and then and only then are you prepared and have you approached the throne of God with the right posture to bring up whatever stuff you might need to bring up for your own benefit or the benefit of others. I and love so that. if that's, that's how we think of prayer, and I think it's a great way to think of prayer, then you use that same word to talk about Mary. And I'm like, I feel I'm not very sure I want to express adoration toward no, another <laughs> and sinful human being. And I know that's nails on a chalkboard for many Catholics, but that's it. I'm hanging on. Um, that, that's one of the biggest getting off points for, for Protestants on the Mary thing is the, I now she, we believe with utter conviction. Now she had problems, she had flaws. She was a person, she was blessed like crazy and unique among women, but I mean, she needed to be saved just like everybody else. And um, how could she be born without sin? Unless, I, I mean, the, the argument that Jesus couldn't be born without sin if he was carried in someone who had sin. Well, then how'd that's that not, work for Mary? That's not the like argument. Just... Yeah, yeah, that's not the Catholic argument though, eh? Like it's sometimes formulated like that though. Catholics will say things like she had to be sinless or else Jesus yes, would have contract, all the time. contracted sin. Yeah, and that's, you know, that that's not what the church teaches, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool talking to someone who knows like five steps ahead of what I'm saying. It's kind of makes it interesting. We had to get together for a beer one. Yeah, okay. uh, well, sign me up. But I don't know that's about the, the knowing, but I really like that comment because you you do the exact same thing that I do. Your YouTube channel is like mine. I mean, <laughs> roughly the same number of people are showing up you do other things around the internet as well. You do the podcast thing. I, I really get it. I think I understand some things about your experience. And do you get to a place where it's just tedious when you get certain messages or comments where it's like there's a chessboard sitting in front of you and somebody walks up and they're like, guess what? I'm moving this pawn forward two spots. What do you make of that? And you're like, I know. And now I move this pawn forward and I know what you're going to do. Now you're going to move the horsey. Yep, your horse goes there. Just a second. Now I have to move my bishop there. Now, yeah. go ahead, do the next thing. Like I, I know I've done these twenty first moves ten trillion times, and it's not that I don't like you. It's not that I don't care about you. It's not that I don't want right. to spend. No, that's not true. I don't just, want to spend the next. It's just three you find it ultimately unconvincing. Yeah, it's just but, that we've done it. But like, the I know same... what you're going to say, and you know what I'm going to say. Well, and that's so like true, but, but to the end. So. Yeah, fair enough. The only problem is you don't know what the end is with the person you're dialoguing with. And so the same Correct. patience you want to extend towards, say, a Protestant or Catholic who's having doubts about things, you want to extend to the aspiring budding apologist who's trying to take you down. And so, it, you know, it's like trying to be like, OK, and, and maybe just and maybe instead of being like, OK, you moved your pawn. Let me get like, let me get here's what I do. Maybe being like, OK, like, let's focus on why you moved your pawn first. Like, tell me, tell me about about this pawn. Yeah. move. you know. That's exactly sure. the play. That's exactly the play. But so often that is unsatisfying for the person who wants to have the conversation. They yeah, yeah, yeah. they want to do the first 10 moves. I say this, you say this, you cite this verse, I cite that verse. And all of that is easily and readily Googleable. I really, like you just said, I like to get to the human part of the conversation as quickly as possible. So I got a friend and he's asking this with, with some... Uh with some with 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 a smile so don't take this to be as sort of intense as it sounds but he says someone's got a gun to your head and you have to choose catholic or orthodox what do you do and i should say this this patron of mine he left his position as a protestant youth pastor and is now currently feeling very torn between orthodoxy and catholicism so again he's yeah. asking this with a smile but what would you say to that or do you want to just say no shoot, shoot me <laughs> oh i can um if he's on this side of me, I use my left hand in a sweeping motion to knock his arm away. Then I spin that <laughs> arm behind his back, disarming him with a twist. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm not picking. And you're a jerk. You need to learn more about the Lord. Okay. Is that just, not an option? Well, no, just to be clear, like he, 
Yeah, he's he's being funny. Like he's 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 not he's not actually forcing you to take a side so that he knows where your flag is no, planted. I... So I suppose to put it kind of yeah, and, and I see what you're doing. You're you're being funny, and I'm taking you as serious, which is making everything awkward. But I suppose <laughs> if you were to sort of say, you know what, I find I find there I find orthodoxy or some version of orthodoxy less less problematic than Catholicism or vice versa. Would you want to say something like that or no? Uh, I I wish you gave me Anglicanism as a third no. option because no, I, I would pick Anglicanism. Um, if you, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think right now my gut would say that I would simply because of the unknown elements and what seems like a bit more flexibility to yeah, yeah. fit the Protestant liquid into, I think I would be Orthodox in the short term I suspect the way my mind is wired, which is very Western, would cause me to gradually feel friction in that environment. And then if those were still my only two options, I think I would gradually end up Catholic. That's just my guess yeah, for enough. how it would play I out. love it. I love it. Hey, you know, you and I had this, and we'll, we'll maybe end on this because my wife just texted me and I just suddenly realized I have to do something that I haven't done. Um, <laughs> but you and I were saying the other day how like it can be sad when you feel like you're just not with some of your YouTube subscribers anymore. Like people who are like with you and then they say something, you're like, ah, dude, I know that you're on my side and we should agree and you want me to agree, but I can't here. So I'm about to do that. So this this is something okay. that someone just threw up and I'm just like, dude, don't, what are you doing? And this is this is what's called begging the question, right? I'm curious what flaws the, this Protestant thinks the perfect queen of heaven and earth has. It's like, dude, like... <laughs> Yeah, like, bless you. Like, I get it, right? If you assume that Mary is the perfect queen of heaven, then you would also have to say then that she doesn't. she wouldn't doesn't. have flaws, would she? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, yeah. respectfully, there's about 10 trillion questions I could phrase like that to just aggressively fire right back that are utterly fruitless. If the question is asked out of goodwill, the first yeah. thing I would point to would be the text in the middle of the book of Matthew, when Jesus' family clearly doesn't understand what he's doing, and they come to collect him before he goes on a road trip with them to Nazareth. They, they don't know what to make of what he's doing yet. They don't get it. If the flawless yeah. queen of heaven is the flawless queen of heaven, she should have unlimited clarity on exactly what Christ was trying to accomplish and would not come and not even attend his sermon. She sat outside and skipped it because of whatever social pressure she was feeling. Does that make her a bad woman? No, she's yes. like the best no. woman ever. <laughs> who I hold in crazy high regard, the highest regard of all the women who have ever existed for me. And I would hope any Protestant is Mary, mother of Christ. But I mean, even in the text, she needed taken care of. So Jesus assigned someone to take care of her on his way out the door. And she clearly didn't get everything that was going on. She had flashes of belief. Do whatever he says. He knows what he's doing at the wedding at Cana. But then also, she isn't sure what to make of it. So is that a flaw? Not one that you get after anybody about. I just told you I have a whole bunch of flaws like that. But yeah, it means she has limitations. And she does not know all of the things. And she was in a process of understanding who exactly this person was she gave birth to in the first place. I'm not threatened by that at all, and it doesn't diminish my view of her remarkable quality or how she's blessed among all women. Did I take that question too seriously? Have I done wrong? No, I think it's great. And and I'm not going to do that thing where I kind of respond and say what I think, because I just I, I think the, the main point that I loved about what you just said was the beginning bit. It's like, OK, if this were asked in goodwill, I think that's just something we got to challenge ourselves about. Like, am I am I asking this? Like, sometimes people will say, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, you know, what's the greatest book of all time, and why is it the Brothers Karamazov? You know, like that kind of funny kind of thing. And so, obviously, that, yeah. that's a joke. But it's like, yeah, it's like, am I am I asking to learn what you think, or am I just trying to stump you? Yeah. All right, um, let's do just well. Let's let's wrap up. This is a pleasure, Matt. I really am appreciative for our discussion and uh, thank you kindly for agreeing to come on my show. What else? You want to say nice things about I, me? 
it's, it's been a treat. Yeah, I do want to say nice things about you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm apprehensive about jumping on, especially with a, a live stream. Yeah. Because, well, I, look, I'm not trying to pick a fight with the last person who made a comment, but that's why I'm apprehensive because the internet yeah. does that. The and it's, it's just, that. it's a mix of not getting it in terms of social dynamics, a mix of passive aggressive weirdness. And that person doesn't have to be on a camera with their name and their face and their reputation pushed to the middle of the table. So easy for them to say. And so when I find allies who care about things that are beautiful and redemptive, they care about the text, they care about the Christians who came before us, they talk like a normal human, and they don't need me to think all of their things uh, in order for us to try to be useful in each other's lives. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled about it. I, I Allies are hard to come by, man. Uh, I want them. And so I, this dang well better not be our last conversation, man. I, I like your style. And I think you, I, I think you make your expression of Christianity look beautiful. And that's, that's among the highest compliments somebody who does what I do for a living can give. I, I, Thanks, man. I love the way you represent who you are and what you believe. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, and I think I'll, I might be on your show in the near future. So I look forward to that. People who are watching, I think we're going to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Click. So in the in the title, we have a ten minute Bible hour thing. Click click that link. Be, be sure to go subscribe. And look, let's see right now. We got one thousand and thirty people watching. It's funny. Like people will like invite me to come and speak at a church. And I'm like, dude, it's just so hard for me to justify leaving my family when like you can do this. You know. <laughs> No, come speak yeah, to 10 people. Like, well, yeah, but I also have four kids and I can, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I like them. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I don't, I'll come. But right now. I'm <laughs> Absolutely. Gonna, yeah, just, just let people know we have 712 likes. Uh, 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 this is definitely a bit cheeky, but if we get up to 1,000 likes, I'm going to send this uh, beer stein to Matt. Let's be honest. I'm just going to send it to him anyway. Thanks for being here, everybody. God bless. Thank you so much, Matt. Have a lovely day. Thank you for having me. This was awesome.